Hello, uh, this is a video on hand calculations for uh, a Virendil girder. And here's a great, great uh, Virendil girder in Berlin. Uh, right. This is the seventh video in the series, and it will only really make sense if the previous videos have been worked through. Uh, the aim of this final video is to show a, an approximate, just an approximate analysis of a Virendil girder. So uh, let's get cracking. Here you go. Previously we've looked at different types of frames with pinned feet, stiff beams, fixed feet and multi-storey. Now this is the second video on Virendil girder analysis. Just approximate analysis, that's all. So here we have a, um, a Virendil girder. Um, let's say it's a bridge, it's 12 metres long and it has um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bays of 1.2 meters. So it's not a very long bridge, but hey, it's 12 meters long, 1.2 meter high, square bays, and a whole series of nine 10 kilonewton loads, making a total load of 90 kilonewtons. Nine times 10 is 90. Right. So uh, this structure is symmetrical, therefore I would expect that the uh, 90 kilonewtons will be supported equally uh, by. Uh, each end of the bridge at 45 kilonewtons. Okay, so in the last video we talked about how shear transfers along the top cord and the bottom cord, and in doing so it creates uh, bending moments within members. And we chose points of contraflexure to create uh, to use as the edges of our little subframes along the length of the beam, uh, as long as the length of the Virendil girder. So what I want to do now is I want to start at this left-hand side. So I'm going to I'm going to create uh, some subframes by putting in point, by taking creating pins at points of contraflexure in the middle of each of the um, horizontal uh, cords and in each of the uh, vertical elements. So the first subframe will just be at the very left hand edge of the uh, bridge, and uh, here it is. So it's, there are two subframes there uh, created by pins which have been introduced into the structure oh, I'm not sure. I'll just these are two subframes so they can have separate pins uh, and there they are right now I know that if I have a, a vertical reaction here of 45 kilonewtons then uh, a total of 20 45 kilonewtons has been transferred along the building in uh, along the bridge in shear and it'll be 50 50 22 and a half in the bottom cord 22 and a half in the top cord let's add that in there 22.5 kilonewtons. There we are. So I can work out the bending moment uh, in this um, bottom cord here. I can simply say it's fixed here, pinned here. There we are. Fixed. I've got a load of 22 and a half. This distance is 0.6 meters. Therefore 22 and a half times 0.6 uh, gives me a bending moment. So I'll superimpose on that model of 13.5 kilonewton meters and then I'll draw that on I'll draw it on the right actually to keep it nice and clear so we've got a bending moment here of 13.5 kilonewton meters uh, right so that's tending to bend that around to the tune of 13.5 therefore there must be if I take moments around this this point there must be uh, the moments must be in equilibrium and so uh, there must be a horizontal force in this leg, which there is, uh, which is creating a similar but opposite bending moment to the tune of 13.5 kilonewton metres. And yes, that is happening because there's a horizontal shear in here creating this bending moment of 13.5 and that shear acting over a length of 0.6 metres must be 22.5 kilonewtons. The fact that all these shears and actual forces add up to the same, that's because it's a, a square structure, and so it kind of makes sense. But if I take moments around this point, I've got two 22.5 kilonewton forces acting in opposite directions, so the joint is in equilibrium. Okay, that's good. How about the, uh, the upper part of this frame here? Well, I know if I've got a horizontal shear in this vertical member of 22.5 there, I must have something similar, well, exactly the same opposite direction there. That's giving me a bending moment of 22.5 times 0.6 which is 
13.5 acting in the anti-clockwise direction and I already know that I have the vertical shear in this member which is acting in the clockwise direction so 22.5 times 0.6 lo and behold it's the same bending moment 13.5 so the whole thing is in equilibrium each of these forces each of these little subframes so I've got a little L-shaped subframe here which I've worked through and a little L-shaped subframe there which I've worked through so I worked out the bending moments in each of the uh, horizontal and vertical members with the bending moment being zero at the pins, uh, which I've modelled as model bus. Yes. Okay. So now, if I move along the frame a little bit, so I've, I've already looked at this little part. Now I'm going to move along to the next part of the frame, which has a 10 kilonewton load applied to it. I know the shear force in this member on the left and this member on the left, so. I've included those in my models already and I can actually say that this 10 kilonewton load is applied to the top of the Virendil girder and that is going to reach the supports 50% through the top cord, 50% through the bottom cord. So there'll be an axial force of 5 kilonewtons down here which means that in this, if I look at say the, the top member first, it doesn't really matter which I do, if I resolve vertically at this point now, I have 22.5 plus 5, that's 27.5 going up. Therefore, I must have an internal shear in this member of 17.5 kilonewtons. I can do exactly the same for the lower member. If I have 5 kilonewtons going down, 22.5 going up, there must be a force of 17.5 kilonewtons acting downwards. And that's the shear, the internal shear in this lower member. I can calculate my bending moments now. I can calculate that uh, 22 and a half times 0.6, these are all, everything's a 0 0.6, so that length is 0 0.6, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. So 22 and a half times 0.6, I already know what that is. That's gonna be a bending moment there of 13.5 uh, kilonewton meters. That's gonna be 17 and a half times 0.2, and that's acting in this direction. And 17 and a half times 0.6 is 10.5 kilonewton meters. So this, from the left leg and the right leg, this joint is being spun round in the clockwise direction by 13 and a half plus 10 and a half, which is 10, 20, 24 kilonewton meters. So I know that there must be a, a, a bending moment in the leg of 24 kilonewton meters. And that occurs when I have an internal shear of 40 kilonewtons acting over a height of 0.6. There we are. So this joint is now in equilibrium. I know what the horizontal shear is in this member. I worked that out because uh, 40 times 0.6 is 24, therefore 24 divided by 0.6 is 40. So I worked it out. Uh, the bottom is pretty much a reflection of the top uh, with some and then we move along the structure again so as we move along the structure we've now covered the left hand bit the left hand column now the second internal column we could then move to the third internal column not forgetting the uh, 10 kilonewton force applied to the top so here are the first two columns that we just dealt with and summarised on that sheet. It's the next one, the 10 kilonewtons at the top, 17 carried over from the previous calc. And we can end up uh, calculating the bending moments throughout the entire structure. I'm going to add them onto a single bending moment diagram so that we can see, um, see them all together. And it's useful to do that because uh, Virendil girders are a little bit strange <laughs> to most people, they're not commonly designed by engineers. So it's worth having a look, uh, first of all, at the uh, beams, at the horizontal members, at the top and bottom cords. So which of the top and bottom cords is most, carries the largest bending moment? Well, this cord at the end 
carries a bending moment of 13 and a half, which is greater than all of the other bending moments. So that is the most heavily loaded member. It also carries the most shear. So I'm going to put in there max, BM and shear. Now what about the vertical members? Which is the vertical member with the greatest bending moment? Well the bending moment of this fellow is 13 and a half. This one is 24, then 18, 12, 6. Ah, so the member with the greatest vertical the vertical member with the greatest bending moment is actually not the end one, but the uh, the penultimate uh, vertical member. So that's got the maximum bending moment. And uh, is that important? Well, yes, it is important because it means that uh, rather than having to do the hand analysis for the entire virendial girder, you could, if you're savvy, you might just say, well, I'm just going to work out a few of these members and call it a day. So hand calcs are... Uh, can be tiresome and, and uh, it's easy to make lots of mistakes so the, the shorter they are uh, the less mistakes you make and the uh, quicker you can get through them. Uh, if you wanted to you could extend this analysis to work out the, the um, axial forces in the top and bottom members. Uh, you can either calculate them through the uh, through your uh, sort of little free body diagrams that you've uh, constructed along the way. So for instance you might say that oh actually if I resolve horizontally for this free body diagram I've got 22 and a half kilonewtons at the uh, in horizontal shear here therefore there must be a tensile force of 22.5 kilonewtons in the bottom cord there just like there must be a compressive force of 22 and a half kilonewtons in the top cord there. Or you can do, a, uh, do something a little bit akin to method of sections for trusses and you could work out, for instance, on the right hand side by, by just considering this structure to the right, what the maximum axial forces in the top and bottom members are. And you'll find that they're not particularly large because that's not the way that these structures function. So hopefully that's useful. Now, here's an exercise for you to have a go at. So it's um, one, two, three, six bays, three meter height, three meter bays, uh, and five lots of 50 kilonewtons. Okay, so here is uh, a solution or an answer to this. There it is. I've just co covered half of the uh, the, the Virendil girder because it's um, equals equals. It's um, it's symmetrical. Therefore, you can uh, there'll be a mirror image on the right hand side. And uh, that's 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 so that has now hopefully allowed you to to carry out some calcs for uh, quite a complex Burundial girder. So uh, I'm sorry about uh, having to rush each of these videos. Uh, it, they do feel quite rushed to me, but hopefully you can sort of pause and uh, replay elements of the videos. And I hope that with practice you can become confident in your hand calcs for both framed structures and for Burundial girders. So uh, best of luck with your preliminary analyses in the future and thank you for watching.